Uh, welcome to the participants uh, and the panelists of this uh, 33rd webinar of the 40 webinar series that in half and some 50 partners are hosting on uh, rethinking city in general and rethinking the Indian city in particular. We started in mid-June 2020 and will continue till end January next year. I'm not sure if we have shared with you with sufficient clarity the purpose behind this webinar series. Let me tell you briefly why we are doing it. The entire effort is premised on an understanding that whichever ways we see it, we as country, as government, and as people do not appear to be on the right track in managing India's daunting urban challenge, be that macro or micro dimensions, infrastructure or governance, land or river, environment or poverty, sustainability or investment resources, now or future. And it is a costly lapse, very expensive situation, whether it is ensuring reasonable living accommodation and safe drinking water to a slum dweller who has made a city his or her home or the goal of $5 trillion economy in five more years. Because with cities as engines of growth will have to play a key role in that happening. By underperforming on this front, we are compromising on the country's overall future, not only on its urban future. And this is not a figure of speech. This is a statement on an overpowering reality. Even if this analysis is not original or fresh or new, the prescription here probably is. And that is to say that it does not help blaming it on others. And the way to doing it is to internalize it and say what I, we could do and define our role in search for correctives and alternatives. This has two important implications. One, not to blame the government and expect it to do everything. And two, look for ideas, new approaches, solutions, and ways of doing things from those outside the government system, those in business, industry, academic world, professional, civil society, etc. It does not underplay or undervalue the government's role in managing the urbanization properly, developing cities imaginatively for proper policies and institutional development and judicious investment. It explores additional avenues for new ideas, workable solutions, and innovations. And it is based on assessment that there is considerable expertise, skills, experience, and insight outside the government system that must be harnessed. As we approach 33rd webinar, it is clear that there is much knowledge, understanding, ability, concern, and experience in the wider society to shape a new narrative in addressing the urban challenge, in making it a societal challenge. How to mobilize, galvanize, and actualize the potential and resource creatively is a challenge in itself, but it must be seen as doable. 
and we all must see to it that it happens. So this is the kind of perspective. This is an understanding. This is the, the, the thought process behind this webinar series is to identify internal societal resources to meet the urban challenge. Having said that, let me clear the way to starting today's dialogue on city planning and urban informal livelihoods. They were discussing India in a comparative perspective. We have a strong panel anchored by Dr. Marty Chen, who is a senior advisor to Viego, that is Women's Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, and a lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School uh, in the USA. Let me say a few words, more words about uh, Marty, the she's advisor to Viego. Her areas of specialization are employment, gender, and poverty with a focus on working poor in the informal economy. She has been two decades of res residential work in Bangladesh and India, and she was awarded Padma Shri by Government of India in 2011, I didn't know this, and Friends of Bangladesh Liberation War uh, Award by Government of Bangladesh in 2012. She is ever smiling, ever concerned, and ever compassionate person. Having done that, a few very quick announcement. One, there will be a question and answer. Please place your questions in the chat box. They will be discussed. This is number one. Number two, let me inform that the next webinar on the same theme takes place tomorrow. At the same time, that is 5.30 to 7.30, it is on cities and women informal workers anchored by Renana Zavala, who is the executive director of uh, Mahila Housing Seva Trust. And please know that these webinars are being recorded fully and available on Inhaf's website and YouTube and Facebook. Over to you, Marty. Thank you very much. Please conduct the session now. Thank you so much, Kirti Bai, for the introduction, but more importantly, for inviting uh, Myla Housing Seva Trust and also WeGo um, to organize this pair of webinars um, on cities and the urban informal workforce. Um, today's webinar will introduce um, the important topic of city planning and the urban informal economy, how city plans, policies and practices impact on urban informal workers. And tomorrow's webinar at the same time as Kirti Bai said, will be on um, cities and women informal workers, uh, moderated by Reynana Jabwala. I want to just say that the two organizing or <laughs> organizations, co-organizers with INHAF are Mahila Housing Sewa Trust and WIGO, and both have recently celebrated significant anniversaries. And we have a slide on Radhika, please, a slide on the two books that were brought out, uh, one to mark the 20th anniversary of WIGO and the other the 25th anniversary of um, Myla Housing Sewa Trust. And between the two, I think you can get a very good understanding of the informal economy, both urban and rural, and importantly, what community-led <laughs> city making, um, the book that um, Bijal Ben has uh, co-authored with Ray Nana Ben. Thank you, Radhika. And before, um, introducing the first speaker, I wanted to set the stage, so to speak, with a few brief points. One is that in developing and emerging economies, the majority 
of urban workers are informally employed. And in a country like India, it's the vast majority. 80% of urban workers in India are informally employed. And this urban informal workforce is not only large, it's also very heterogeneous. Um, so you have the street vendors and the transport workers and the waste pickers who operate in sort of more public space. You have construction workers and tradesmen. You have manufacturing and factories, workshops, a lot of it at home. I was struck by, this is webinar 33, and there are two 33% figures that are really important. 33% of all manufacturing enterprises in India are home-based. And 33% of all women workers in India are home-based. So the home as workplace is a critical issue for urban planning. And of course, there are the informal workers in hotels and restaurants, domestic workers. It's a broad heterogeneous group. And for the urban informal workforce, but particularly for the self-employed, the city's rules and regulations, what the city does, its practices, have a direct major impact on their livelihoods. But informal workers tend to remain at the periphery of city plans and, and policies. Um, most cities do not take the informal economy into account when they think about local economic development. And when you think about sites and services, it's usually for where people live, it's not for where they work. You think of public space, few city officials think about the right of the street vendor to vend in public space. When you think of zoning regulations, these two facts, these two 33% figures suggest that we need mixed use zoning so that people can produce goods and services from in and around their own, own homes. So there's a range of issues that are very important and central to the well-being, but especially to the livelihoods of the urban poor. That being said, I will turn now to our first speaker. It's my great delight to introduce Shalini Sinha. Shalini Sinha is um, the India country representative of WeGo. And I should say WeGo is a global network of um, informal workers. We're part think tank and part social movement. And we were founded in 1997. Ila Bhatt and Renana were co-founders um, together with me and seven others. Uh, Shalini will speak about informal workers in Delhi, uh, who they are, where they work, and what their demands are, what their needs are, and the importance of their voice. Shalini, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marty Ben. Can I have my PowerPoint up, please, Radhika? Thank you. Or can you put it in the PowerPoint mode, please? Thank you, Marty Ben, and thank you, organizers, for giving us this opportunity. Um, can we have it in a PowerPoint mode, please? And um, I am going to speak, as Marty Ben said, about informal workers in the city of Delhi. Um, a large number of whom predictably are in informal, uh, a large number of workers in the city are predictably are in informal employment. 80% um, of all workers in Delhi uh, corresponding, reflecting the national figure are in informal employment, but uh, la uh, in terms of numbers, as per, as, the, as per the last PLFS, it's almost nearly 5 million workers are informal workers in the city of Delhi. Can we have this in a PowerPoint mode, please? Slide one. Ma'am, it is in the PowerPoint mode, it's only. Oh, so, okay, fine. Yeah. yeah, because yeah. I think what Shalini is saying is, can you go to slideshow view, please? Yes. So that it okay, screen. I'll uh, add. Yeah. Uh, okay, all right. It is not coming in PowerPoint mode on your side? No, it's showing all the slides on the sides. Can you put all it right. on slideshow? Yeah, thank you, Gautam. 
So as Marty mentioned, informal uh, workers are a heterogeneous categories. And one other aspect when we are looking at it from the perspective of the city planning, uh, it's important to note is that uh, this large number of workers also work in informal spaces in the city. So not only is their employment informal, but they're also working in informal workplaces. The very notion of a workplace talks about formal place of work, which is a factory or a shop, uh, but informal workers work in informal spaces. And if we are going to look at spatial dimension of informal work in cities, I think two broad categories we can divide, uh, which is public spaces as place of work and home as places of work. And if I'm in my presentation, I'm going to examine both these categories in the different sectors of workers which work in these two categories to, uh, uh, for provision. Uh, uh, to see what is the kind of uh, challenges and the risks that they face as they work in these uh, different places. So the first, uh, first one, next slide please. The first one is um, public spaces as place of work. And we the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this is the one, yes. So as I said that informal workers operate in work sites that are not re recognized um, as workplaces typically and the implication it has. So when we first talk of public space as a place of work, the first group that is very visible to us are the street vendors. And the street vendors, because they're working in public spaces, which is not recognized, is often then they are looked at by city administrators as encroachers, which results into harassment, bribes, confiscation of goods, evictions, and also lack of quality vending spaces when we are designing uh, vending spaces. Uh, if we are in city policies. This is in spite uh, the fact that in India, we have a law, a legal environment, a law, a street vendors law, which is, um, which is very positively inclined towards uh, the, uh, which is a progressive looking law, uh, asking for street vendors, encapsulating many of the street vendors demands and rights in its uh, articulation of how street vendors need to be, street vending need to be carried out in cities. The second group of workers you look at is waste pickers. They are roaming the streets, they're collecting waste, they're segregating waste, they are working at Dalhaus, they are working at different uh, uh, informal spaces, segregating waste, and there is no recognition of their contribution to the city's waste management system. There's no um, allocation of space for uh, waste segregation facilities, again, there is a solid waste management rule which talks about decentralized uh, waste management at the city level, as well as uh, integration of um, waste pickers, but in the absence of decentralized waste segregation centers, in the uh, absence of an effort to preserve natural recyclable markets, or even to provide for space for kabaddi shops in local commercial markets when they are designed, the waste pickers operate in a realm of uh, insecurity where they are, again, they face a lot of harassment uh, and non-recognition. The third group, again, that we can look at is construction workers. They work at sites. They are visible but unprotected, living in very poor um, conditions and working in equally uh, poor conditions of poor housing and service access. They are often migrants. They have different set of housing needs, which may vary from small to uh, from a shorter to a larger period. Uh, so, and they have very little because of the migrant status, uh, access to any kind of uh, schemes or social protection programs. So the dominant narrative that we see in pu when public spaces are places of work, that much of the work, although happens there for informal workers, there is an element of stigmatization, which is associated with it, with whether they are called dirty, whether they are called polluters, uh, whether they are accused of causing congestion, and in recent times of not maintaining social distancing, and uh, introducing I think we've lost Shalini Ben. Is that correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I guess she has dropped out. I'll give her a call and check. Why don't you do this? 
um, in the interim. Uh, just go to the next slide, Radhika, and I, I, Marty and I can pick up for her and just yeah. gently keep going. Yeah. All right. And hopefully she'll be back by then. Just give us the next slide. So, so Sina, yeah, please go ahead, Gautam. So I think the second thing that's important in what Shalini is framing, we were discussing this in our pre-meet, so we'll just, Marty and I will just push some arguments until she's back, is to think about the differences then in which if workers that are visible in public space both invite a certain kind of um, gaze by the state and have a different set of challenges in gaining legitimacy and recognition for their work, workers that are in private space face a different set of challenges. Um, one of them, I think, particularly is in the case of home-based work, while Marty talked about the 33% figure, which is a very significant figure, the discussion around informality very often actually tends to stop right before home-based workers. Um, and home-based workers have been organizing um, in order precisely to increase the visibility of this form of work. But the notion of the quality of their work is determined then very deeply by what is actually considered a residential spatial form. So when we think about the minimum unit of affordable housing, for example, the 25 square meter, 30 square meter, we're thinking about housing as shelter. And home-based work will think then about what are the development control norms or what are the norms for house sizes that anticipate that affordable housing is precisely where actually work is imbibed into the home and therefore refusing the notion of housing only as shelter. Um, particularly, again, the overlap between a lot of low-income affordable housing in Please southern and in. Indian cities tends also to be tenure insecure. Do I hear Shalini? Shalini, yes. are you back? Yes, I'm yes. back. I'm really sorry. I don't know why this happened. No, 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 Thank no. you, All right. Gautam. Well, <laughs> well um, Gautam has ably picked up on the home as workplace in the case of the home-based workers. So perhaps you can continue with Pick up the, the, dom domestic on the domestic work part, Shalini. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So for domestic workers, um, we uh, what we often see is that they also work from home. I mean, domestic workers, largely women, work from home, but not their own home, but home of their employers. And it is often, several studies have shown, they often like to live the, uh, in proximity to the uh, where their uh, employers are. Uh, which has implications on costs. There is also implications on travel um, and transport that uh, with both in times of um, money and in times of um, time. Uh, <coughs> and, um, uh, and the quality of uh, space where they are living uh, with access to services, et cetera, all of which impact on their uh, taking up the kind of work that they do. Recently, also, we have uh, also uh, one of the issues that domestic worker groups are uh, very stridently raising up uh, is the whole issue around rent. So when they live in uh, areas um, uh, around where they find employment, the rent is a very big issue uh, that they face. And uh, we will see subsequently, I will talk about rental issue coming up in other places also. So rent is a uh, huge issue as is transport for the domestic workers. But what I also want to submit is that home is a workplace partially for other groups of workers also. So the waste pickers collect waste and uh, because their whole uh, work depends on economies of scale and the street vendor would store goods, the food vendor would often uh, pre-cook some of the food that they're selling and in the absence of any space or any kind of uh, storage or uh, any refrigeration or uh, facility or any kind of um, uh, clean water, um, uh, some of these issues are really a challenge. So when we look at home as a place of work, what we see is that the, what we need to do is to almost challenge the very notion of housing, which looks housing for the poor, which looks as homes only as a place of habitat. And once we start looking at homes as a place of habitat, as well as a place of livelihood, we go beyond the issues that we are dealing with, which is quality and affordability, very important issues, no doubt, but also linking it to livelihood. And as we've seen, it, it varies across sectors. So when we link it to livelihood, then another another set of issues that come up, which is about also about 
uh, investing in housing and uh, building increment housing, uh, uh, all of which is uh, linked to livelihood uh, needs of the informal um, workers. The other issues that I men mentioned earlier policies okay. that address rental housing needs of the urban workers uh, that are also critical. Uh, the third thing Shalini that Gautam Master mentioned is this whole thing. Shalini, two yes. more minutes, so you have to move okay. quickly. <laughs> okay, is this whole issue about uh, mixed zones. So my third, uh, um, third issue that I want to raise is this whole thing uh, in the recent times, which is very uh, relevant to the recent times. Next slide, please, is the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, COVID-19 and lockdown uh, impact. So uh, what we have seen in Delhi um, uh, is what has been reported across the country, which is near total loss of livelihood due to lockdown and abrupt and not very targeted relief measures and a crisis of hunger. But Vigo has also been doing uh, a 12 city study across 12 cities in the world, in Delhi being one of them, and looking at all the four sectors, a sectoral impact of um, uh, the COVID-19 and its lockdown. And what we have seen is a, not just loss of complete loss of income in the lockdown period, but a slow and uneven recovery and a drastic fall in earnings due to restriction at place of work, lesser days of work available, health risk, falling rates for material disrupted supply chains. I also want to say that lack of social infrastructure, Anganwadis and local health clinics, which were being closed, have added further added to the care burden of women, uh, which our study also reports. 51% of workers with dependents in Delhi said that their child care had increased, and uh, women further reported higher increase in cooking, cleaning, and other care responsibilities. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So the demands of the informal workers, some of which we have already said, essentially one is that you don't count if you're not count as to statistical visibility, not in terms of just numbers, but also enumerators as workers uh, and also mapping of work site. And certain, secondly, largely nothing for us without us. So integration of informal workers uh, voices. Uh, essentially, I want to close with the submission that alloc allocation of uh, space in the city to live and work and livelihood planning is critical uh, with, along with a participatory planning process. The concept of city and city developments need to integrate uh, informal livelihoods and therefore have a new approach entirely which we call a livelihood centered approach to planning. A bottom up planning approach that responds to the way people live and work in the city which would have, which would be actually an economic and social game changer in the future of urban India. I want to finish by the last slide where I want to show you about a coalition uh, uh, called Maybe Delhi campaign, which is, which is uh, in Delhi where uh, uh, worker groups, civil society organizations, activists and academics have come together to demand for a um, city which reflects the need of the marginalized group informal workers being one of them, but also homeless people, also disabled people. And one of, the, one of the pegs on which this campaign's work hangs around is influencing the master plan of Delhi. And also uh, small pilot projects, which are show and tell kind of pilot projects. Thank you very much, Shalini. I think you just broke up, but Diana thank you for, together. yes, thank you so much. And thank you for setting the stage by really introducing us to the place of work and the demands and uh, the needs of workers, particularly in the recovery from COVID. And thanks for mentioning the Delhi campaign, which Gautam Bai will pick up on. Our next speaker will pick up on another theme, which is the community-based uh, planning. Uh, this is Bijal Bhatt, who is the director of Mayala Housing Seva Trust. And Bijal Ben will speak about how pre-designed plans and planning norms actually work against the interests of the poor and the working poor 
and the importance of community-led planning. So over to you, Bijal Ben. Thank you, Marty Ben. Uh, so as Marty Ben said, uh, we have been working to improve the housing, living, working and environmental conditions of poor women in the informal sector for 25 years now, directly working at the grassroots. And then our advocacy emerges from whatever bottom up experiences we have while working with the informal sector. And I'm going to talk about those experiences. Radhika, can we have the slide, please? This is the last slide. Can we go to the first one? I think this is somewhere in between. No, please yeah, go back. Yeah. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Now uh, let me start with a program which is very well known uh, both nationally and internationally. This is the slum networking program, which is a slum upgradation program where with the municipal corporation of Ahmedabad, we were providing a package of uh, services. As I said, you can see six services at the household level, toilet, water, sewerage, roads, street light, stormwater drainage, uh, and solid waste management. And uh, you know, the scheme could not go ahead, especially because of two planning norms and one program, uh, one program guideline. So as for the planning norms, a distance of minimum 10 feet was required between two opposite households when we went into the slum to undertake the paved roads or to give infrastructure like, you know, pipe water supply or uh, sewerage. What was happening then was that entire houses in the slums were getting wiped off because slums are denser localities. So uh, the communities then told us that why don't you just get off, go away with your program. You know, we don't want our houses to disappear and we will then do without water. Uh, because we have been surviving for years now without water or without a toilet. Now, here is where the program got stuck. And then we had to approach the city officials. Uh, and the bylaw did stay a 10 feet, uh, you know, distance. Uh, then we uh, undertook negotiations, organized the community and, and within the partnership, you know, brought the municipal corporation on the table. And uh, undertook some, so what was the non-negotiable? So the municipal corporation came with us, came to a ground that the non-negotiable in this case to implement would be that the sewerage water should not get mixed up with the drinking water. And that minimum a vehicle like an auto rickshaw uh, could go into the slum. Um, that was the uh, you know uh, requirement that we arrived at. And then we said, uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, provide the road, which is, you know, between three feet to five feet, uh, so that the water and sewerage water doesn't get mixed and, and you know, uh, the slum is accessible. Uh, the important thing here to note is that most slums in uh, class two cities in India are not like Delhi or Bombay, where you have, uh, you know, kilometers of slums. Uh, there are, these are smaller slums with average household size of 250. So you can actually go in with a stretcher or uh, with an ambulance, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which can be parked at the door of the slum and the stretcher can go inside or a fire uh, van, which can be parked at the door of the slum and you can extend the pipeline. So that was decided. And uh, then uh, the existing scheme. So one is the planning norm and then how does the scheme, what is written in the program guideline? So the existing scheme for, was only for residential purposes. And so when we went ahead to implement it, there were, as Marty Ben and Shalini Ben already said, households providing, uh, you know, uh, households pro which were producing goods and services, they were home-based workers. And so the municipal corporation then actually stuck to the fact that they could not go ahead in the slums because, uh, you know, housing, the, the scheme was only meant for residential purposes. So what we did next was to argue it out with them that, you know, this would essentially mean that you are laying a water line in a slum with four houses, which are only, uh, which are only uh, housing themselves and not using it as a workplace. Then you pass through and leave two houses, which are do using their houses as work as workplace, and and go ahead. And so, what will those houses, which where a pipeline is passing through, but you still won't illegally connect them, uh, would do? because they don't have a legal water connection, they would puncture the pipeline and uh, take the water. And you won't be able to monitor it across the city. So that was well understood by the, uh, and these are 
in by definition not commercial uh, you know businesses these are really really micro businesses that the informal sector uses to survive so that was then understood because the partnership was very good and then the water pipelines were uh, actually also extended to all households which were producing goods and services so this was the bottom bottom up you know approach that we had to take fortunately the municipal corporation understood and uh, though the uh, and understood and then relented and we could go ahead next slide please so this is how the slum would look with uh, this is perhaps a little bit bigger than five feet but this is how a slum would look before and after when we did the parivartan program on the slum networking project next slide please uh next is the pradhan mantri awas yojana which we are implementing the housing for all scheme uh we have a third vertical where the private sector developers are brought in uh, to do undertake the in situ redevelopment uh, at the where the slum is existing now this is the case of gujarat where to, there were there was a 2010 policy guidelines where minimum 36 square meter size of housing was uh, stated and then when this scheme the, the guidelines were revised in 2013 the uh, you know the size became 25 square meter and when we when now where we went out and started mobilizing the communities one of our way was to expose these communities to existing housing which were 36 square meter and uh, you know uh, so the home based workers really found that 25 square meters was not doing justice and they started agitating uh, for more as was given to their uh, you know uh, uh, to their uh, to their uh, fellow slum dwellers in the past scheme uh, since these schemes were being do done by the private developer and the cost was to be borne by them uh, there was a negotiation between the private developers the municipal corporation and us and the people and finally because the cost was to be borne by the private developer they they we came to an agreement of increasing the size to 30 square meters again in the same scheme they did not have shops so it was only for residential purposes no shops for the poor were planned and there were many people who were also using their housing as small shops and selling things out of it so um, uh, since this scheme was again for residential purpose you know so there is a direct conflict between the planning norms and the scheme guidelines as they come out because the scheme guidelines won't look at the planning norms of the city this is you know uh, gujarat actually allows for mixed use and mixed zoning but that that is in the planning norms but when you get a scheme from the government which actually funds the housing the scheme speaks for residential purposes only and here is where the conflict arises and again shops we we then discussed it with the municipal corporation and the state and later on shops were introduced in the scheme so those poor who had who had shops in their houses could also get access to shops along with the residential housing so this is how the scheme was modified can we go to the next slide please uh i am talking about delhi now uh we have been working in delhi uh, you know with the informal sector women workers in a slum called sauda ghevra and what we have been trying to do along uh, with working in delhi since the delhi master plan is coming up we are also a part of the delhi Uh, maybe the leak campaign uh, we have been trying to educate uh, the slum dwellers about the master plan uh, technically so uh, this is an example where you see the slum sauda gevna on the map located in the zone n of uh, uh, delhi uh, uh, delhi means uh, uh, the delhi ncr region can we go to the next slide please yeah so this particular slum actually sauda gevra was relocated in 2006 when the commonwealth games were happening in delhi and this is the and when it was relocated this is in the within the zone and this is the layout plan uh, which actually showed you can see the dark black area on the map which you know on which it is written stp meaning sewage treatment plant so when this layout was planned actually uh, there was a sewage treatment plant proposed at sauda gevra now when we went to sauda gevra in say 2010 4 years after the sewage treatment plant was proposed and they were relocated there was actually no sewage treatment plant existing because the sewage treatment plant though proposed 
its budget had to come through a different scheme where a different organization of the municipality would be involved so the municipality would be involved or uh, the delhi uh, uh, you know uh, jal board would be involved whereas the land use was being given by the uh, delhi urban shelter board so there is a multiplicity of uh, organizations and usually the uh, the urban plan in india would only release land so urban planning in india usually only releases land but the plans uh, as suggested the for the construction of the infrastructure would come from a different scheme so the sewage treatment plant was not existing at all and we 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 discussed this plan with the uh, people and they did want the sewage treatment plant because sewage treatment was a big big issue can we have the next slide please uh similarly this is the map of savda gevra which showed a big road passing through which would be used for it's a main road and where you know uh, it would be easier to get access to transport for people this road also was not existing because uh, although the land in the land it was released and it was planned for the budget for this road had not come uh, from the for the scheme uh, so what happened was can we go to the next slide please yeah bijul ban end up yeah yeah quickly yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you can we go to the next slide please radhika radhika next slide please yeah so the people said no go to the previous slide please go to the previous slide radhika so well i i'll just do without this okay so the people said they had no weekly markets the people said tenure was still not provided although they were resettled they did not have a legal title there was no road connectivity although a road was suggested no water uh, network and no sewage treatment and a lack of cremation ground uh, which uh, there was no uh, land earmarked for the lack of cremation ground so basically the urban planning which releases land and the scheme have to work in totality which brings in the infrastructure uh, so and again here the can we go to the next slide please yeah so let me just show you uh, this scheme that we did with this is an example of a market based scheme that we did with a developer and what kind of planning it involved in amdavad so we were doing low income market based housing with this developer these were low income uh, you know uh, housing that we had planned and according to the development control norms it required uh, 10% of the total plot uh, you know created as you see in the first slide Uh, exclusively for the common plots uh, then we made a representation and then that was uh, you know uh, by the municipal corporation and the planning authority rather than 8 10% it was made 8% which was reduced but when we talked to the home based workers and people they wanted such small decentralized spaces as common plots to be used so that they could ac uh, access it easily and when we designed it in these way and presented it to the uh, development authority the total plot area in terms of decentralized places was actually coming to 10% vis a vis the 8% that they had reduced but this was unfortunately our demand was not uh, accepted for low income housing this actually shows that in our development control regulations which is a part of planning we don't have a place for low income housing and we don't think for low income housing and don't talk bottom up can we have the last slide please so basically the issues urban planning norms are too technical for a lay person to understand and in this maze of technicalities the poor really get uh, you know uh, uh, it really gets very complex for them to talk to the city authorities because they then make things very technical so we are trying to demystify these technicalities for the poor by teaching them about zonal plans layout plans and of course in india urban planning is different at different places which make it Uh, makes it more complex it's different for different cities in fact not even states uh, and in india urban planning only releases land and the construction of infrastructure or whatever is planned has to come through a different scheme under which the budget uh, is allocated and if those have conflicting wordings then that works against the poor uh, and so uh, that's what uh, is the issue and slums actually are relocated often in metro cities like delhi but you know uh, the land is really land may be released for the location but it it's not the budget doesn't come for infrastructure planning and implementation when they are relocated as you see in savda gevra they were relocated in 2006 but till to till date they don't have a sewage treatment plant or a road which was their demand 
Uh, I think that's the end. Thank you so much, Dijal Ben. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I always learn technical things when I hear you speak. You're so gifted at uh, working your way through all these different jurisdictions and organizations and norm and making it all happen for the poor. Um, so our next speaker is Gautam Bhai Bhatt. And Gautam, as everyone knows, is the senior faculty at the Indian Institute for uh, Human Settlements. And of course, he's a well-known urban activist and scholar. And he will speak about why it's so important to take the in urban informal economy seriously in master planning. So over to you, Gautam Bhai. Thanks, Marty. Thanks a lot, everyone. So I'm, I'm just going to pick up and move quite quickly on uh, two points that I want to make. And I'm basically just piggybacking and abstracting from Shalini's presentation, uh, talking already about the spatiality of informal work and Vijal Ben's presentation about the disjunct between current planning norms and existing practices, both of spatial informality and economic informality. And I want to abstract a little out of particular case studies because collectively as a panel, we have the advantage of both those details and to ask questions at a slightly different scale and want to suggest on what it would mean to for spatial planning, particularly master planning. So I'm going to be quite narrow in my understanding of planning for the next few minutes to think about taking a different approach to the informal. So basically, if you look right at it, if your intent was to include informal workers, what would that actually mean for planning practice? And I want to suggest two approaches on what can be done within the current constraints of India's physical planning um, processes, which have a lot of constraints for any of you uh, who've engaged with it, you know. And I want to specify that I'm not going to, because Bijal Ben spoke about it quite extensively, talk a lot about the housing and spatial informality part of informality and planning, but really focus on what Shalini was talking about in terms of the spatiality of informal work. So two main propositions out of what could be many, but in paucity of time, I just want to think of two. I think one of the things that Shalini brought out and that COVID has shown us very precisely uh, and painfully is the centrality of thinking about public space as a planning form that is centrally structured around livelihood. So if Shalini says that a livelihood-centered planning approach is the need of the hour, I wanted to begin to think about what that would mean in terms of creating and designing that public space. And I want to suggest that one of the first things about informality and planning is that the way master plans approach and understand the categories of open space and public space that are typically either on the green space side or on the public circulation and infrastructure side needs to be rethought through categories that understand public space as a place where certain forms of spatial practices of informal work are welcome. And I want to suggest that you to take up on those examples, four examples of what this could look like. The first would mean a very different approach to the street, um, regardless of its length and its width. And I think here there has been a lot of academic work on, for example, the idea of the multi-use zone street design. And if you, if you Google the work of a lot of transport planners in India, you'll see some of this work that talks about the design aspect of what it means to divide the street, not only to enable vending, um, but also to enable non-motorized transport and walkability and, um, and accessibility in terms of bicycling, for example. Chennai has begun to take on some of this work on street-based redesign. And I think it's a really interesting thing to first begin and rethink the street itself. The second, of course, is the category of natural markets, which a lot of informal organizations have used for a long time. I think that the idea of the natural market is precisely to think about a principle that I want to leave us with, which is that informal employment spatiality has a logic behind it that makes that employment viable. And I think that in understanding where informal work should be encouraged and recognized in the city, it is important to actually begin not for the planners to go out and say, where do we think it should happen, but to actually look at the existing practices 
of informal work and say workers were already telling us where that employment is viable. They're telling us where the markets exist. They're telling us where the supply chains exist. So it's really the principle I want to leave us in work in public space is that the archive we have to draw upon is the existing spatial patterns of informal employment, as opposed to again taking a, taking a planning gaze where we begin and think that as planners, we can decide the way we think we can do for formal employment where that work should occur, as opposed to learning from where it is already occurring. And I think natural markets are precisely the right example of saying the archive already exists. The question is, how should the plan recognize, protect and enable, as opposed to either evade or recognize in a form of criminal or negative inclusion? I think that the important second point important I want to make here, though, is that there, when we invite planning to look at informal employment, we must also insist on the boundaries of what that gaze can do. And what I mean by it, this is specific. Informal employment is characterized not only by a certain vulnerability, but also a certain flexibility and culture of innovation. And the balance between the flexibility that makes it possible, but the vulnerability that comes with some of this flexibility means that approaches to formalizing informal work spatially have to attempt to find the right regulatory balance that both protects vulnerability but acknowledges flexibility. Because a hand of formalization, even through planning, that seeks to overly formalize in the sense of control will actually make the natural market not be able to be adaptive the way it is when it's informal. I think it's important to recognize this through the example of natural markets, for example, where if the time and the boundaries of the natural market are protected, it will both allow the market to not fear insecure tenure, but it will also allow logics of self-organization within the market to dominate. But if a planning approach in natural market seeks to do plot and site level regulation, then therefore the logics of autonomous control by communities and vendor organizations begins to diminish. So the question of inviting planning to recognize work also invites the question on what the terms of that recognition should be. And I think that in the book that Marty showed you when we started, there are several excellent contributions precisely arguing about what does formalization precisely mean? Which parts of informal work need recognition and support by the state? Which parts of informal employment should remain outside micro control of state practices? So therefore, the question also thinking about, for example, new forms always requires this question of balance. And I want us to, I want to leave us with this tension of not thinking of saying, we want to include informal employment in the plan as an unambivalent or self-evident good, unless it comes without respect for the agency and flexibility of informal work. Right? And I think the challenge for us is to find planning mechanisms. For example, planning through boundaries and edges instead of micro control of zones and locations. What is the right balance for that? And I think there the question Shalini brought up of participatory planning becomes pivotal because the only way that balance can exist is if people who run those markets, who founded those markets, are part of deciding how much regulation is too much regulation and how little regulation is too little regulation. I want to also suggest that you know it's new forms of recognizing the spatiality of work are necessary. And that's why I'm using this word called work activity clusters. And I'm using this work of work activity cluster. So our current notions of the spatialization of work in master plans tend to be very narrow. Thinking about industrial, commercial, mixed use, like manufacturing, very self-evident spatial geographies that aren't able to hold the kind of blurred boundaries of the way work happens. For example, a lot of home-based work is actually clustered in particular specialities in the city. You will find it in an influence zone around a resettlement colony or an industrial area, not within it, but connected to it. In Delhi, if you were to take four examples of where it occurs, there is a particular kind of home-based work that happens around Silampur because of the lo location of local garment work, a particular one that happens nearby Timarpur and Vazirpur that are known old manufacturing areas, and a different kind of piece rate home-based work happens in Sarda Gevra, the resettlement colony in Northwest Delhi that Bijal Ben was also referring to. But the question that planning has to ask is, is there a relationship between particular forms of urban use, either in industrial area, commercial area, et cetera, and particular geographical patterns of home-based work, for example. This notion of a work activity cluster allows us to think and pushes us to think more creatively 
about the blurred geographies of different forms of informal work and think about clustering in those. And therefore it invites a different zoning practice that doesn't believe that work ends at the boundary of the industrial zone, but actually that it blurs and moves across. And if you think about what those look like, we can even think about this as an influence zone around a transport interchange, for example, which will absolutely invite a certain set of informal spatial practice and congregation. The third point I want to make about working public place, and I'll stop after this and move to my next one, is that it requires the planning, not just of space, but of time. And I cannot stress this enough. Again, the flexibility of informal work, its ability to adapt to different contexts must teach us something about formal practices of physical planning. One of the things it must teach us is that informal workers know how to use space across time. You know how to be flexible and adapt it, to use it for a different part for a period of time or a period of the year. If our plans are able to think not just of mixed use as a spatial category, but in question of plural use across both time on a particular site, it would allow a certain kind of practices. Take the example of urban farming in Delhi or farming and urban agriculture on vacant plots in Delhi. What form of temporary leaseholds would allow small temporarily vacant plots to become farm sites for community gardens and agricultural workers for three months, six months, nine months with protection? How can we think about natural markets as a logic of time as opposed to space alone? How can we think about flexible forms of housing for workers that work on timeshares when they're on construction projects and don't want to make permanent housing in the city, but don't want, should not be living on the construction work site with the building under construction itself? So when we think about the question of planning time instead of planning space, we're once again trying to bring lessons from the current <laughs> flexible practice of employment into our formal planning practices. My second main point, and the one I'll close with, is to think about the fact that if informal workers are in public space and we recognize it, we have to acknowledge that what we can, can currently consider public infrastructure or social infrastructure under the plan needs to be rethought a little bit because it needs to respond not to just citizens or the public in open and public space, but to workers in public space which means our notions of moving beyond saying, so we would all agree that public toilets are required because of the mobility of citizens. But would we think of a common storage area for goods um, that vendors use as a public infrastructure under the category of plans? Would we think of, of attaching to our current notion of health dispensary, for example, which is a known social category, the idea that the health dispensary should integrate other socioeconomic livelihood functions, for example, being a space where home-based working women can actually step out of the constraints of the home that Chalini reminded us are often infrastructurally unsuited to their work environments, but work in proximity um, to residential areas. How do we insert the Anganwadi into a workplace public infrastructure and work into the Anganwadi infrastructure? So what I'm suggesting is to think about a decentralized and distributed public infrastructure that needs to insert itself at multiple scales across the city, but that needs pivotally to combine functions in a way that current master planning does not. And I'll give one example, and I know I'm at my time, Marty, so it's my last minute which is to say that one proposition of the Mehmet Dili campaign was to reimagine what we often call the community center or the community hall into a form of integrated public infrastructure whose functions, as you can see, would not just include known <coughs> work and care, child care, public meetings, but also livelihood support in its design. And which at different aspects of our scale could distribute those functions differently. And this is a very simple, tangible point, which is to say that notions of social and public infrastructure must not just look at the social and the infrastructural, but also at the economic. But it ties together a question of saying that the street vendor does not just need the right to be on the street. They also need a supported infrastructure in order to be able to have a dignified workplace, which is in public space. So if you think a little bit about what these new public infrastructures could look like, Part of it is about centralizing the question of work into planning, like Shalini was saying. And in this brief time, I wanted to give you two key reflections on those and remind us again that the entry of informal employment into planning will not be self-evident because the logics of the plan are not the logics of informal employment. So the first step has to be to recognize 
both what is vulnerable, but what is positive, constructive, and agential about informal employment, and learn and incorporate those into practices that planning can recognize. Thank you so much, Gautam Bhai. I always learn how, you know, Wigo has been trying to say that the logic of informal employment doesn't fit the logic of not just master plans, but labor economics. Um, and you put it all so beautifully well. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, <clears throat> our next and final speaker is uh, Jenna Harvey. She's also with Wigo. She's the global coordinator of uh, Wigo's focal cities, and Delhi is one of them, and Shalini is in charge of the Delhi focal city, but there are four others, and Jenna will speak on examples from two of the focal cities on <coughs> how urban plans impact urban informal workers. So over to you, Jenna. Great, thank you, Marty, and thanks to all the presenters. Um, if I could just get my presentation up, Radhika, thank you. Um, so we're all sort of piggybacking on each other's presentations today. Um, so I'm going to speak about many of the same themes that um, my colleagues here have, but speak a bit more about livelihood-centered planning from a global perspective, um, and especially from the standpoint of WeGo's work in support of organizations of informal workers. Um, so first, for some context, WeGo's focal cities are where we work to directly support informal workers organizations in advocating with the city for a better deal. Um, and by a better deal, I mean that we support workers in advocating for changes to status quo urban planning and practice, which as everyone has made clear today, um, often keeps workers, informal workers at the periphery, excludes informal workers, or in some cases actually criminalizes informal work. So we argue instead for an approach to planning, which is responsive to the lived experiences and needs of informal workers, and which recognizes and enhances their existing contributions to the city. So that's what we mean by centering informal workers' livelihoods. And a lot of this work involves explaining and showing the city how it can be done, precisely because of what Gotham was saying about the logics of informal work not fitting with you know, the planner's imagination. Um, so much of what we do is facilitating a process through which informal workers can imagine and articulate alternative ways of planning and um, integration that protects and promotes their livelihoods. So I'll talk about two of those processes today that we were involved in in Accra, Ghana and Mexico City, Mexico. So um, next slide. Um, so our work to center informal workers' livelihoods falls, it covers many areas, but falls mostly within these three pillars in the urban context. Integration of informal workers into public space, um, particularly looking at regulations for informal work in public space, integration of waste pickers into solid waste management systems, and integration of informal worker uh, representatives into systems of urban governance. Um, so next slide. First, I'm going to share an experience from Mexico City in the area of um, work in public space. So these are mariachi musicians. They are um, non-salaried workers in Mexico City. So non-salaried in Mexico is a definition that encompasses multiple groups of workers who work in public space, including um, musicians, artisans, coffee sellers, newspaper vendors, and shoe shiners, for example. So the existing regulation that applies to the work of non-salaried workers in Mexico City, like so many other regulatory frameworks for informal work in cities throughout the world, is both outdated and punitive. It restricts non-salaried work in many different types of public space, um, making it very easy to evict non-salaried workers, it also restricts access to licenses only to those workers who can prove that they're literate and have no previous criminal convictions. And in any case, the cap on the available licenses is low. So when the city announced that they would develop a new regulation for non-salaried workers following the passing of this very progressive city constitution a few years ago, we go started working with a group of non-salaried worker leaders on a proposal for how they would want this regulation to look. So over the course of a year, um, 
they meticulously reviewed the existing regulation and you know looked at that next to their lived experiences and needs in in public space to articulate something new a new proposal so next slide that proposal was based on two principles the elimination of discrimination against non-solid work and the extension of social protection so they proposed expanding access to public space to cover many of these areas um, that had previously been restricted in the existing regulation to simplify the licensing process and eliminate those discriminatory elements of uh, literacy requirements, criminal convictions, um, to recognize natural markets and to involve non-salaried worker leaders in determining where those natural markets are. Um, again, this relates to what, what everyone else here has been saying about informal workers knowing best where those markets are and, um, and what the needs are of the workers who, who work there. Um, also, I just wanted to note here that in both of the examples I'll present today, there is lots of sort of um, cross-pollination with, with India and with our work in India. So here, we were inspired by the Street Vendors Act in India um, and the idea of natural markets and that, that factored into this proposal process. Um, so anyway, the second principle was the extension of social protection. Here they proposed using this regulation as a tool through which social protection, uh, such as maternity benefits, childcare, and social security could be extended to these workers who were currently falling in the gaps of the social protection uh, system. And healthcare was already included in the existing regulation, but they proposed ways to improve on that and extend the healthcare benefits offered uh, through the regulation. So next slide. So this is this is the proposal. I also wanted to make this point that uh, the process of, of articulating this proposal served as a mobilizing tool. So this is a photo of a demonstration of multiple groups of non-salaried workers, um, musicians, shoe shiners, um, organ players, artisans, demonstrating outside the city Congress um, in defense of this proposal and in defense of the rights of non-salaried workers. After this, or during this demonstration, the city Congress actually welcomed inside a delegation of worker leaders to present the proposal. Um, however, unfortunately, the city Congress never brought it to a vote and, um, and things sort of, you know, it, it got shelved, so to speak. During COVID now, um, the, the issue has come up again and a proposal has been circulated that's actually quite regressive towards non-salaried work. So again, you know, the leaders start from the beginning, the advocacy begins again. They have this existing proposal that they'll bring back out and, and advocate with and organize with. Um, so, you know, just to also give this, this example of these processes, as, as everyone here knows, are in, incredibly complicated, you know, a few steps forward, a few steps back. And until informal workers have statutory spaces in urban governance to, um, you know, to be involved in the development of these regulations um, and to have their inputs incorporated in the regulations, um, this will continue to happen where, um, you know, regressive proposals will come up and the advocacy will need to continue. So that is where that case stands now. Um, now moving east, if I could get the next slide, um, I'm going to share an example of advocacy for planning alternatives in the area of solid waste management. So this is a photo from Pong Landfill in Accra, Ghana, where approximately 300 waste pickers work. Um, many of them have worked there for years and have become very specialized in their work in extracting recyclable materials from the landfill. Um, this is one of the biggest sources of recycling in Accra. And um, however, you know, they work without recognition, protection, contracts um, from the government. They work informally. And this year during the COVID crisis, you know, there's a couple of examples here of how the crisis has been used by cities to actually push through um, punitive measures and actions that they may not have been able to get away with previously 
So during the COVID crisis, the landfill was abruptly closed and the decommissioning of the landfill was initiated, which displaced all of these workers um, who are currently operating from a proximate site, which is inadequate and from which they also may be evicted again. Um, so in addition to advocating on one level for um, the government and potentially the World Bank, um, who may have some involvement in this, to legally you know, meet their requirements for livelihood safeguarding. At the same time, the Pong Waste Pickers Association has been doing some of the government's work for them in scoping alternative livelihood solutions off the dump site. Um, so next slide. So what this has involved, um, and this, this was initiated actually before the displacement because um, they anticipated that, that this could happen. And so with the support of WeGo, the Waste Pickers Association has been scoping livelihood alternatives in underserviced coastal communities. So they identified these communities close to the dump site along the coast that aren't currently reached by the formal solid waste management system. Some, some of which um, is because they're physically inaccessible, there's other reasons, but they, they're not getting formal waste collection. So the waste pickers have gone to these communities to do door-to-door -door household collection um, and building alliances with community leaders in the process, collecting data on you know, how many households they can reach, how this could be profitable, to package together this proposal for the government to be able to say, um, look, you know, you need to, to apply livelihood safeguards and here's how you can do it. Here's an alternative proposal for integrating waste pickers and extending formal contracts um, for waste collection. So then just to conclude, um, next slide. Also very, very quickly before I conclude, um, yeah, again, in the example of Pong, um, there is inspiration being drawn from India from the example of KKPKP, the Waste Pickers Cooperative in, in Pune. So in all of this work, global solidarity, you know, cross city learning is absolutely key. Um, so anyway, just to conclude now, I'm, I think I'm at time, sorry, Marty, but um, this is just echoing what, what everyone else has said here that, um, you know, what we're, what we're advocating is first a recognition of informal workers' existing contributions to cities. Um, so, you know, we see in both of these cases, waste pickers filling gaps in solid waste management system, providing um, a source of recycling, you know, working towards the city's zero waste goals um, while being completely unrecognized and often even stigmatized for that. Um, in Mexico City, these non-salaried workers bring tourists, um, you know, mariachi musicians are a staple in the plazas and the squares of Mexico City, um, but they are also often stigmatized. So starting with this recognition, um, and then with these proposals, we're advocating for integration of informal workers, um, but not just as Gotham said, you know, integration for integration's sake, integration on favorable terms that's centered on their knowledge about what they need, um, and a key part of this is making the argument or making evident that by doing this, you unlock the creation of new value, not just for workers, but for the larger community. So, you know, the solid waste management in these communities that currently don't have waste collection, um, uh, making a regulation more, um, you know, accessible and clear creates more employment within the sector prevents the city from spending funds on enforcement that are, you know, enforcement drives, which are ineffective and punitive. Um, and then finally, just the last point I wanted to make is that, that my colleagues here made as well, without a permanent role for informal workers organizations in ongoing governance and decision-making around the rules and regulations that affect their livelihoods, um, you know, this, this can't be sustainable. So it's, it's critical that informal workers organizations have that ongoing role in urban governance. Um, yeah, and I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna. That was um, really rich to hear those two examples and your point, I think, about the global learning and exchange that is also happening so that um, groups of informal workers uh, by sector are learning from each other around the world. Um, so we will now open it up to um, 
questions and I have looked at the Q&A. I know I think there's some questions under chat, but I'll start with the questions under the Q&A. And um, Shalini, there was one question to you about um, the migrants, you know, that come into Delhi, that come into all the cities that were exposed, you know, during the lockdown period, we came to know um, so much about them and their situation. So the question is really, how do you think about and categorize these migrant workers in the context of the informal economy in Delhi? Um. Just to respond that uh, migrant, uh, the, the what we saw visuals were of, and very disturbing visuals of migrant workers going back. A large number of them obviously would be from the informal sector and several, several of the sectors, like I mentioned, construction, domestic workers have a lot of migrant workers. And some of the issues that we highlighted, you know, um, uh, in terms of recognition at the city level, uh, having therefore having less or little access to relief that was available, and um, 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 being penal uh, being uh, burdened by the rent burden that was there. So some of these issues were integral to why many of these workers decided to go back. Rent is a huge burden in the absence of a steady income. Uh, if you don't have your Aadhaar, which are registered, uh, uh, Aadhaar cards, which are registered in the city, access in the initial days to food relief and others was challenged. Subsequently, that was also addressed. But so uh, the issue here is addressing the challenges that are faced by informal workers in terms of their identity and recognition at the city level. And there are multiple ways of addressing that. So instead of us and them, I think that uh, inclusion of these workers, of these informal workers, whether migrants or not migrants, into city development uh, policies will go a long way. Um, and some of these have been addressed in the um, presentations today. Thank you. Uh, Bijal Ben, there was uh, two, three questions to you. One is, whether the examples that you have spoken about are documented in your wonderful book um, on the city makers. Another is, is there a risk when you do the de decentralized spaces in these um, uh, in, you know, informal housing uh, plans of encroachment when you have a lot of small decentralized spaces? And then I think a request from uh, Kazi Baby in Bangladesh, who's with the Bangladesh Home-Based Worker Network, perhaps something that you can um, have an exchange with her offline because she's asking about partnerships and funding for housing. So over to you, Rachel Ben. Uh, thank you, Marky Ben. So to answer the first question, uh, yeah, some of these ex some of these experiences because we have quite a lot and we have. Uh, a history of uh, working for 25 years. So some of the experiences uh, would be documented in the book uh, that is just released, which is the City Makers. And I would urge people interested to buy it and uh, you know really support it. Uh, the second question on spaces uh, being designed in a decentralized manner or a centralized manner. I think it's not about centralization or decentralization. If you look into my example, the side which had a centralized space, all the houses there could also, you know, encroach upon uh, the open land because they, it was available on their side. That is usually what happens when even in formal housing, uh, you have corner flats or corner bungalows. Uh, you know, in India, you will see that they, you know, extensions have been made by, uh, you know, the middle class or the rich people where you have formal bungalows or societies. So I think it's more about human behavior rather than uh, spanning out the spaces as centralized or, centralized or decentralized. It's more about human behavior. Uh, to Kazi maybe I would say that, especially for housing or for infrastructure, uh, there's not much funding which is available from at least international donors. Uh, 
uh, we would uh, we would be very willing to partner with you and uh, you know uh, uh, we have been exchanging information uh, through homenet south asia uh, in the past uh, but what donors fund us for is actually capacity building and organizing for the uh, you know in with the informal sector uh, with the people with the poor and the women and uh, through that so typically our proposals would say that you know we would get x infrastructure or y housing or uh, z uh, you know infrastructure investments made by the city governments or by the state governments through the capacity building and organizing of the poor um uh, so uh, that's how typically we get funded especially international donors but now with the corporate social responsibility law being in place in india uh, some of the hard infrastructure is getting funded but that has been limited to toilets and uh, uh, you know water connections etc not housing per se because it's very investment heavy um and then one question where i'm mindful of time to gotham which is the role of urban design in um, these informal work uh, spaces and the work activity clusters. Um, uh, how you see urban design playing a role? So I think that the, um, um, you know, I, I, saw, I saw Prabha's question in the chat as well, and I'll just combine them both in the Q&A. And I think one of the things, so I think one of the things is there is no question that an, uh, that design has a role to play in really being able to find the right spatial configuration that enables certain kinds of activities as part of informal employment and supports them. I think the thing that we have to be careful, so you take an example of the National Street Vendors Act, right? Or you take an example that talks about, you know, so in an answer to Prabha's question, the impetus for change is coming from a new national legislation that recognizes street vending. And it tells planners, 2.5% of your population should be assumed to be vendors, make space for them, but it doesn't tell them how. So the question then, the impetus comes from the act, a new kind of state citizen contract that explicitly recognizes a form of informal work. This is happening around the world now as worker organization and worker activism translates into increasing interfaces with the state. And this is what I was talking about is that we're no longer talking about informality as the parallel, the invisible, the unseen, the, you know, the, that I think that moment has passed. I think now the question is, how should this recognition occur? So there's one example, the National Street Vending Act. Now, how do you spatialize the right to vending or the recognition of vending in the street? What does a vending zone look like? Is it a single spatial site where lots of vending happens? Does it take the, is it a distributed and fragmented right to vend on multiple kinds of streets? Are we creating congregations or diffusions? Are we thinking of hawker markets like they are in other cities? Are we thinking of large natural markets with peripheral vending zones? Are we integrating the vending into metro stations and bus stations? So I think the you know, planners need to think about their instruments, rethinking the traditional notion of zoning or spatial conglomeration into more diffused and mobile and flexible planning practices. Um, particularly to me, the idea of breaking up this idea of the zone that has a clean spatial boundary is where we need to start beginning, right? And not to do it by declaring something mixed use, but thinking about multiple and plural uses across time. But the designer comes in at that point on saying, if we decide that vendors are going to congregate around a bus station, how does the design of that spatial area shift to accommodate vendors without, again, trapping them to a single spot where they must vent? but or allowing them a certain flexibility where their vending is protected but they're not consistently needing to fix themselves in a certain kind of way so i think that urban designers have a really strong last mile role to play in giving us the spatial forms around flexibility and recognition but at the same time i think that requires urban designers to rethink a little bit of their role as designers which is not to find the spatial expression that they think will create certain behavior but actually to find spatial expression that fits flexible and dynamic behavior. Um, good design practice would do that. I'm not sure the way we, in India at least, professionally trained planners or designers, we quite instill that sensibility of listening to the street as much as we should. But I think all good designers would do that. So I think there's a key role here, but that role follows, I think, the conceptual questions, the political negotiations, the questions of recognition, 
only post that to me, in my personal opinion, can design come in. I don't think design can solve the problem unless those questions of recognition are first in place. Thank you all very much for those. I'm mindful of time. And there was one really uh, thought provoking question about what is the real lever for change? And is it laws or is it the plans and the schemes? Um, and I think what we've been hearing from this group that one important central lever, um, and Jenna touched on this and others did as well, is the inclusion of the urban working poor, the urban informal workers, they are organized in many contexts. They have leaders who can be represented at uh, the relevant policymaking rule setting processes. Um, and this, the campaign around the, the people centered uh, master plan for Delhi is an example of engagement of a coalition of organizations to engage with the state. Um, and the very important aspect that for the urban self-employed particularly, it is the state labor relations in the sense of the, the non-salaried workers of Mexico or the self-employed um, that really is central to this and they need a voice at the planning table. And I just want to say that the livelihood centered approach, the community led approach is, is very key. And I think just to end a note on COVID, it, it's, a, it's a very important moment because we could revert um, to, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's my phone. We could revert to um, the bad old deal where they were stigmatized and criminalized. Uh, or unfortunately, there's a real risk of a worse new deal for informal workers because I think, um, both the state and capital are using COVID as a pretext to do things that they already always wanted to do in their own interest. And what we really want is a better New Deal for these workers. And I think the lessons from all of these presentations uh, speak to both what is desirable for the urban informal, but also what is what is feasible. There are good examples and there are networks and organizations fighting hard for a better New Deal going forward. So I'll end by just sort of thanking <laughs> the participants and I wanted to thank the organizers. Um, there were a number of people from MHT and also INHAF, Aneri and Chaitna and Nita and Radhika and Radhika, we got to know all of you in the in the weeks and days leading up to this. Um, um, and of course, I want to thank the speakers because I think this was a brilliant lineup and you all really uh, complimented each other in your remarks. So thank you so much for that. And then over to Kirti Bai uh, for some concluding remarks. And thank you all very much. Oh, thank you very much. I think you know, there is not much to conclude. Uh, thanks, Mary uh, and the panel, Amati and the panel, for this uh, very rich and insightful discussion. It was very, very good. And that is, of course, what we would expect from a panel like this, you know, which has such glorious experience you know, of working all over the world and, 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 and brought in this insight so thank you very much and i think you know so we're grateful to you marty jenna salini ji bijal man of course gautam uh so thank you for for your contribution and let me remind that you know uh this meeting in in a manner of speaking is not ending today it continues tomorrow and therefore please be available those who can for the for the for the webinar tomorrow, which is cities and women informal workers uh, uh, will take place at the same time. Uh, we're grateful to all participants who are in attendance, and thanks to the team, uh, uh, with the studio in half colleagues, uh, for the very hard work behind the scene. Uh, so thank you, Radhika, uh, Dr. Hari Haran. Shimul, Alika, and Nita. They've been working very hard for a long time. 
and they were making this uh, uh, a very, uh, very fruitful experience. So thank you very much. Uh, 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 and of course, Marty uh, and 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 uh, and uh, Bijal Ben and Mahila Seva uh, organization for organizing this and bringing this uh, wonderful group together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Kirti. Bye. Bye. It was a great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Gautam. Yeah. Gautam. Gautam. Yeah, Kirti. Bye. I can hear you. I just just wanted to ask this question. I think one area we've not thought about, and something on which I was doing some work is looking at the roof terraces you know, of the buildings across mm -hmm. the country. It's a huge space. I agree. It's a huge open space. It's a completely unused space, you know? And it's, uh, it, is, it is as big as a built city, more or less. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think there's a new group is, uh, there's a new group in uh, Delhi that's been working on this quite a bit on urban farming and agriculture and they play all the scales from the riverside bed to vacant plots to building gardens to rooftops like they do the whole kind of building to this thing strange I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting their name right now but they've just joined the campaign and they're just, we're writing one report Swati Janu is anchoring it from the campaign side well, and they've been working they? precisely on this so where are they? It, She's, she's going to pick this up exactly on this point, which is how, what are the ways in which you can get urban food production? They're looking from that lens, but all the way from building level to vacant plot level to riverside Yamuna farming, this sort of connection on thinking of these productive landscapes, uh, I think is a very interesting idea. The European cities do much better on this. I think Berlin is, for example, really good with community gardens on vacant plots in concrete and on building sites and rooftops. So there's, there's, I think there's a lot of that built up space that's really valuable and, and possible to use in new ways. They haven't thought it through very well. You know, because I agree. in terms of uh, space, it's a millions and millions of square feet across the city. And it's across the city, it's everywhere. <clears throat> and it is there. Yeah, everyone, I mean, the folks that have had their eye on it for a while are, this, are folks who have been pushing it to be used for either solar power or rainwater harvesting. But I think there's, that doesn't work everywhere. And I think, but, but this has a much more intimate, also links to kind of local traditions of, you know, growing a certain set of food at home, thinking about what those practices could look like. I think there's a lot of potential in thinking of the built up space. Yeah. What yeah. they're saying in the new plan is, I mean, if it comes through some of the discussions around the new plan is actually some sense of moving towards like using allocations, not just in land area, but in terms of built up space. If that happens as a planning approach, then allocations of built up space can be used for multiple, then these things become a lot more feasible. So that's yeah. Yeah. something like that. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Yeah. But I just I just to say that I have lots of pictures of rooftops, not of the high apartment buildings, that are completely used, right? I mean, they're they're being used for drying things and not yeah. just clothes, but drying food food items and all of that. So we can't forget that people yeah. are using those rooftops. <laughs> Folks, I have to. I have to step I away. I have so to I'll go. Yeah. Bye, Kirti. Thank you so much. Bye, Kirti. Thank you so much. Bye. Uh, good luck for tomorrow, Marty. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye.